So good morning and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance podcast. I um, hope you're well. Um, I'm very lucky today to be joined by Amir, who is investment partner of Aviate Ventures. Um, Amir, how are you? Well, I'm saying good morning. Is it, is it, more, it is morning where you are, is it? Or is it early afternoon? Where are we? It is, it is. It's a pretty early morning. I'm based in San Francisco. It's now, what is it, 9.05. Yeah. So I already, I already had my first call at 8.00. Uh, which was a diligence call and a deal. So yeah, I, I've been up and running. Oh, good, 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 good. So we're, we're, we're a bit of a light snack after a diligence call, I would imagine. For so, sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, thank you so much for joining us. I'm presuming that backdrop is fake. Otherwise, you've got the best office I've ever seen. Um, it it uh, is, it is. Um, but look, before I dive in, um, you, you're a fairly prominent member of the scene, um, particularly in InsurTech. So probably don't need too much introduction, but... It'd be great if you could introduce yourself and your role at, at, at ABA and what you guys do there. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me. I'm excited for this for this podcast. So uh, I've been investing in like the fintech and insurtech space for almost a decade. However, my background, I, I grew up actually in Europe. I grew up in Germany most of my life. I was born in Iran um, and spent most of my life in Europe uh, on the operating side, either as part of a startup or you know, starting a startup and spend time also on the enterprise side as well as the consumer side and had like basically no background in insurance, to be honest. Uh, uh, but I kind of spent time doing my time on the operating side with, with financial services institutions, though. And, um, you know, before joining Aviate, I um, helped build up Munich Ventures, uh, where we kind of were on the forefront of investing in tech mostly on the product and distribution side and kind of like the InsurTech wave one that came along starting kind of in 2014, 15. And um, with Aviate, we're an early stage fund here based in, uh, in Palo Alto, San Francisco. Uh, we are on our second fund uh, with, uh, with around $180 million as a stimulus size first fund. We are a generalist fund. Uh, we kind of have three kind of core areas that we focus on. One is enterprise, the other one is healthcare and healthcare services. And the third one uh, is fintech, which, which I came on board to lead. And within the fintech sector, I think, you know, there's a lot of overlap with these, within, within those three sectors as well, right? I mean, enterprise kind of overlaps with fintech, healthcare overlaps with insure tech, fintech. So there's overlap, but specifically on the fintech side, you know, I kind of interested in anything that touches financial services that could be insurance, which is a big part of it, and insure tech, which we're gonna talk about today. Uh, on the financial services side, you know, very much interested in still, you know, payments, wealth management, credit, uh, credit risk, um, you know, but also overlapping investments I've done within prop tech uh, that, you know, kind of uh, dives into fintech. However, um, you know, we're very much interested in early stage startups, meaning we invest in like seed, kind of the series A level, uh, anywhere from a million to $5 million check, but I'd say two to three is the sweet spot. I think what, what you know, drives us is that, you know, we're very conviction driven in the investment process, meaning, you know, you, you probably see from my LinkedIn and the investments I've done, you know, I take a board seat. I, I mostly have led all of the rounds that we have done at Aviate. So try to build theses that we have or like interests that we have and try to dig deeper and build conviction around the topic and like really take in a hands-on approach and the company building process Right. Um, some companies I've invested in really had mostly an idea, some some kind of a data set, some kind of validation, but had no products. And mm -hmm. how can we guide them with our experience and knowledge to get to the next level uh, of a company? So that's that's it. In like a two minute pitch. What what I've been doing the last you know couple of years. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's um. Yeah, it's very comprehensive, and 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 I think anyone out there um check me as background up on LinkedIn um, if you don't know him already. Because um, Munich really particularly was a, you know, an absolute hot streak on some of the businesses you invest in, um, some of the really big bets and insure, next insurance and, and, and many others. Um, but I suppose that's, that's a really interesting kind of juxtaposition to bring us to today, because, you know, I, I know this is kind of a fairly open question for some of the works in the venture space, but like, how do you decide what your portfolio should look like? Um, you know, what do you specifically look for? Um, because obviously it's evolved over that period of time that you've been in it. So yeah, now, yeah. How do you make that kind of decision? Yeah. Good, I mean, portfolio construction, I mean, this is two ways, right? Are we talking about portfolio construction in terms of like 
how what what deals we invest in, what what ownership we take, and how much money we invest. I think that's a discussion by itself. But I assume you mean in terms of like um, insure tech and what I'm interested in in terms of the portfolio. I assume, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Please. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> when when again, like ten years ago, when I did my first insure tech deal, um, you know, that was invested in simple insurance, which is uh, you know the product warranty kind of play at the checkout. We're kind of the first ones that, you know, interesting enough was an embedded play at the checkout to, you know, um, buy product warranty for your for your phone or bike or whatnot. And I think, you know, starting uh, when you look at like the history of InsurTech and I wrote like a long article about like the last hundred years of insurance, but I try to really dig deep to understand like, where do we come from, where are we going? You know, the whole wave kind of started in 2009 and 10, around like, you know, uh, price comparison websites and so on and so forth. I think the first wave into like the digital model was by um, uh, was by Metro Mile and Climate Corp, where they tried to like build like digital products and distribute them kind of like digitally through, through the internet. But most of the other kind of plays were around like product comparisons and so on and so forth. And then I think in 2014, 15, I think the MGA wave kind of like took off, right? You know. Um, I think VCs and like the investors kind of saw an opportunity with insurtechs emerging, such as like, as you mentioned, Next Insurance and like uh, Hippo and um, and all the others around there as well. And, um, you know, most of these um, insurtechs kind of focused on the traditional lines of businesses, right? I mean, like home auto renters, uh, Next Insurance went in like the SMB, SMB route. And I think that was the right or like the, the, the easy way in, right? Because like um, off the shelf products, you know, most of them <clears throat> are like uh, very commoditized. And, you know, it was like, how can we bring this to the consumer more friendly and more easily available? And it was the right way to do that and right way to go about it. Um, I think that the, the, the next wave and the way I look at the portfolio here at Aviate and what I'm interested in, and, and you see it from the investment perspective, I still believe like, you know, product and distribution is, is interesting, right? However, my focus has been mostly and entirely on niche or speci specialty insurance products or on the commercial side. I, from my perspective, when you think about the traditional lines of businesses, auto home and renter, like the, the incumbents have been pretty okay in what they're doing, right? They might, you know, not be the, the greatest in innovating in technology and having the best app out there and like being, you know, very customer friendly, if you want to say it. So, however, like, you know, at the end of the day, most of these products are commoditized or fiercely competitive, right? You know, people decide mostly on price if I want to buy auto insurance from Geico or if I want to buy auto insurance by, uh, let's say, Lemonade, right? So it's all about pricing. And um, I think, you know, the, the way I see it in terms of where we're going forward in the portfolio, when you look at like niche insurance uh, markets, most of these niche insurance markets might not be as big as the traditional, like, you know, markets or flow businesses. However, they lack the innovation or technology, technological capabilities, right? Because we have still people sitting in offices looking through the actual you know, models, looking through like some sort of an Excel sheet to understand what is the price and so on. So very like cumbersome process, very like, you know, manually driven, st still email involved and whatnot. And you can really um, innovate there because help these, you know, um, uh, lines of businesses to be more digitally enabled. And you see it in the investments I've done, you know, I've done an investment for, like, for example, in the collectible space, like collectibles insurance, I've invested in uh, life insurance actually in the UK, which is targeted for chronic disease patients, right? Uh, I think the other one what I'm excited about is uh, home insurance for manufactured homes, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. a complete different kind of underwriting technology and methodology over there. Uh, the market is not as big as the traditional home insurance market. However, if you can really enable, you know, carriers and agents with like digital products, I think you can really take advantage there. So this is what I'm what I'm like really focused on is still products distribution focused heavily on like niche or specialized markets. They could be as, as little as like $5 billion premium a year or $10 billion premium a year, right? But I think if you can, you know, take market share there, it's way more lucrative than going after auto insurance and trying to build a newest app, if that makes sense. Mm, it makes perfect sense. And it, it, it's interesting from... Uh... 
in the comparison to banking, I was at an 11FS uh, open mic discussion last night on you know, UX and, and CX design, customer experience, and they were talking predominantly about banking, which was interesting, and saying about user experience is so much better in a lot of the kind of like new apps, um, but the gap between that and the sort of traditional banks is, is closed quite significantly. Um, you know, they were fast movers and we were talking about the Monzos, the Starlings, and, and we still kind of, people were basically had a lot of love for that in the room. But to a certain extent, someone made the point, you know, at what point does the consumer care? Um, and do they care enough to swap? And now that's with a product where mostly you're not paying, or certainly you're not paying up front, your banks make their money in different ways, with an insurance product which is completely commoditized. That user experience, you know, it doesn't lead to necessarily profitability. You, you've got to, you've got to grow, you've got to scale, and, and and that's where some of this kind of obviously problematic pricing of certainly publicly traded uh, insure techs came into play because to get the scale and to get the profitability was almost an impossible kind of equation, certainly from the way that I looked at it. Um, so that kind of leads us kind of nicely into. Uh, yeah, at the start of insure tech when you started investing, there weren't a lot of comparables, no public insure techs. How does one value an insure tech now? Because clearly the mistakes were made. Um, you know, is yeah, the, you know, GDP is it, is it the right metric? Obviously, that's for you know risk bearing ones. Or yeah, how does one approach that? Yeah, I mean, great point. I think uh, I have a lot of discussions these days with either investors or my own startups that uh, that I've invested in and how to look at this and what is the right metric to go out and raise around. And as you mentioned, like the last couple of years when this whole wave started, you know, uh, GWP was kind of a measure because I think, you know, GWP kind of gives us an indi in, um, indication of like how fast and how uh, yeah, how fast insure tech is growing, right? And I think people uh, kind of put GWP and revenue, revenue side by side. And I think the bigger mistake was just to, to think about GWP as kind of a SaaS revenue metric because it's recurring, right? And then there is a lot of, you know, resemblance between maybe the recurring business and insurance. However, you know, uh, the, the, the inherent loss volatility within insurance is not really covered in the revenue or like recurring revenue perspective. So from my perspective, you know, GWP is, is, is an okay kind of methodology to understand what an insurance does and how, how the potential of an insurance company or insure tech could be. But, you know, it's, it's not a measure of like indicating like this is a good startup or not a good startup. Because going back to what I said before, I think if you think about GWP and an insure tech that is like in the traditional auto insurance space, compared to someone who is building in a manufactured home space, it's completely different, right? Um, because there's like, again, the, there's complete different markets, uh, commoditized on one side, not commoditized on the other, fiercely competitive on one side, not competitive on the other side. What is the underlying value of a, of a policy in, in auto insurance and uh, resulting in that the long-term value of a customer compared to the other kind of market? So, you know, you can't like say, okay, this insure tech has $4 million in GWP, this one is $2 million and, you know, we have to value it the same way. I think that's not possible. The way I look at it is like, what is the overarching market here, right? And going back to what I'm interested in investing, right? Uh, how big is this in market in, in general in terms of GWP? Let's, let's talk about manufactured homes, right? It's kind of a $10 billion premium market every year. And, you know, actually growing because like, you know, manufactured homes are more and more interesting in the US. People are interested in, in like living in, in these kind of communities. So it's it's growing nicely and steadily, but it, 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 it's not like the, the $80 billion or $100 billion traditional home insurance market. So you can't compare these two with each other, right? Mm -hmm. But when I think about the, the, the manufactured home insurance market, like, and think about an insure tech that is building there, I'm trying to understand you know, who are the competitors? Like how many competing entities are working in, in this in this kind of environment? Is there any digitization already happening? Is there any like, you know, innovation happening? Are, you know, what is the process right now to get insurance? How are customers thinking about insurance in that in that sense? What is the underlying value of a policy if, an, if a customer buys this artist? Is it the long-term, short-term? You know, is there a lot of, again, going back competitors that people might switch to you know, and so on and so forth. So when you put all of these 
together and think about GWP uh, as a measure, you have to think about how fast and how big can this insured tech grow uh, to, to, to make a valuation assessment, right? So these are the things that I look for when I think about, you know, the measurement. And I always also tell my startups that have, that I've invested in the seed stage that are now thinking about a series A, it's about like, again, it's not about GWP because like, it doesn't matter if you have 5 million, 10 million, if your underlying unit economics don't line up, it doesn't matter, right? So, because if you're spending $5 to get $4 in, something is not right, <laughs> you know, it, mm -hmm. and it, again, it will not get better over time because as you know, you know, building a book of business, uh, once you have it, it's really hard to change it. And it's really hard to like, you know, make it profitable over time. So it, it's better to grow slowly and, you know, convince the market with like, hey, I have a better technology. I have a better product for you, right? I make it more seamless for you. And that's how I can, you know, grab market share over time from the incumbents that are basically either sleeping or not innovating in, in that sense, right? And that's how I value and how, how I see how an insure tech in these markets can grow and be a lucrative business, right? <clears throat> is, because that's, it sounds like a very sensible way of put together valuation, um, but valuations, uh, consensus matters in investment. Uh, why, well, I, I would, I, that would be my conjecture because that sets the market price. That, that's what sends things out of control. That's, that's what sends kind of investment markets into a kind of dicey place when things are overinflated. Um, but how important do you, you know, that's from a very uneducated view on it, but how important is kind of a market-wide consensus for getting kind of accurate business valuations? Because clearly when it goes wrong, it, it sends it into a bit of a spiral. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, think about it. The last couple of years have been just insane, honestly. Like, I mean, there was... I think the only consensus was like, it's up to the right, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I see, I saw, I saw startups and I'm still like thinking about today, pitching me seed stage, you know, idea, really ideas, not even like a product that they haven't sold and wanted to have a hundred million dollar premium evaluation just because the consensus in the market was like, hey, we're growing, everything is growing. So if I have a hundred now, I can get to a billion, right? And I think the consensus now, in the market is like, hey, you know, these valuations, you know, didn't make sense, right? It's it's reflected in the public markets uh, and, you know, reflected also for the insured techs, right? I mean, some of them went to market at like five to $6 billion enterprise value. And to date, I, I, I said it back in the days and I said it today, I never understood why, right? Even, even if you take GWP as a measure, like it was like 20 or 30, 40 X on GWP and, compared to the incumbents that are trading at like maybe two times book value if, if, if they're like really uh, good. So I think consensus is like more driven from investment perspective of where this can go. But I think that's where the consensus is. Like look at an insure tech and I think about it like, hey, can, these, can this company be a $500 million enterprise value company? And if so, what are the metrics that he or like that company has to achieve to get there, right? And it goes back to like, you know, what is what and what market are they are they acting in? How competitive is that market? Mm -hmm. Commoditized differentiated product, the loss ratio of the specific market. And you know, I think most importantly, how do customers make buy decisions? What are distribution channels? Because most of these insure techs that are not public, the distribution channel was like, you know, B2C, right? And it's like CAC heavy, like, you know, you have to spend most of your money to acquire customers. Most of these customers are not profitable. You know, long-term value is not really given, right? So all of these things come into play that, you know, determine, uh, you know, what, what the insure tech is valued at the end of the day. But, you know, when you think about, again, these, these niche markets, specifically manufactured home insurance, right? I mean, the, the market just for manufactured home insurance might be 10 billion, Right, so for for my company or for any other company to be valued more than ten billion is already like you know that makes not really much sense. Mm -hmm. But other others would argue, and I would argue probably too, if you can grab the the majority of that market share and actually branch into other sorts of insurance, such as like maybe boat insurance or motorcycle insurance or whatever, like have like build a book of business, you might be eventually 
valued more than that. But I, I think about the overall market value and how a company can, you know, achieve that or, you know, get like some sort of a uh, high valuation over there. And so going back to that market, if, if there is a series A company in, in that market and gets like a 300 million pre-money valuation, you know, I would be concerned. I'd be like, okay, mm-hmm. that really doesn't make sense. I mean, we have seen it over the last years, right? People got like series A's at the 300, three SPs at like 500 to a billion. Right, where like it was like okay, how how does that work? How does it fit together? Mm, mm. Yeah, no, there was a lot of uh, eyebrows raised at, at some of these valuations, um, from, from certainly from my perspective. Um, but you, you sometimes just assume that people know something you don't, and then you think, no, that some things have just got a little bit crazy and out of control. Um, I know you know you were very kind to jump on a call prior to this, so we, we could get to know each other slightly better. And 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 a particular focus of yours that you were talking about was uh, the Latam market. So really interested yep. to sort of you know you've been diving into that market quite deeply. You know what's really interesting that's happening with insure tech activity in in Latam at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've been looking to this market for quite some time. And over the last kind of six, seven months, even more, as I've interacted with a couple of companies that I'm that was excited about. Um, I think in general, you know, when you think about the LATAM market, you know, there is uh, around so far, I think around 500 million invested so far in LATAM and around over 400 companies. Uh, Brazil seems to be like the largest market, uh, given also the growth of the country with around like 200 million population. but. Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Chile are to follow there as well. However, there is a lot of like pre-seed and seed activity in, in, in that market, right? Very, very few like, you know, mature companies that are serious being onwards. And um, I think, you know, in general, when you think about LATAM and why InsurTech is interesting, I mean, insurance penetration is very low overall, right? And however, like, I mean, I think around $150 billion insurance premiums are written uh, in LATAM, like kind of 50-60 split between PNC and life. And, you know, th- there is a lot of opportunity to not only grab market share and like go for people who don't have insurance, but also like closing the protection gap, which we can talk about a little bit more as well. But yeah. some exciting developments that are that are happening there that I think are fueling the growth for InsurTech over there is um, one of what I've learned is like there is an evolution of open insurance similar to open banking initiative in Europe that is that is that is there like you know open data sharing among organizations and like making you know more access or enabling access to information which includes pricing and the goal is uh, eventually like to provide better products and services to a digital ecosystem and I think another kind of um, exciting topic there too is that some countries within LATAM, I think Brazil, Mexico, and Chile um, have kind of created like a regulatory, regulatory sandbox for, for insure techs where they enable them to, you know, go to market quicker, right? Um, that's kind of an exciting thing. And I think overall, you know, the, 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 the low insurance penetration has a couple of, you know, different um, topics associated with it, right? One is obviously affordability, right? Um, financial inclusion, most of the time unawareness, um, a lot of times actually, and that's where I think the exciting thing is for, for LATAM is unease of buying insurance products because everything is still like very manual, old school driven within LATAM. Um, and also like, you know, regulatory imperfections and the mistrust of insurers are reasons too that, you know, people have not bought insurance. However, another like, you know, thing that, you know, makes insurance interesting in LATAM is that the demographic is changing, right? Um, the the demographic of the middle class is changing. I think thirty uh, percent of the of the demographic is now middle class, and basically, you know, they they kind of. Uh, I was talking to a bunch of people. They kind of resemble what you and I want in, in in Europe or in the U.S., right? They want, you know, financial inclusion. They want financial security. They look for like investments. They look for like how to live a better life and so on and so forth. And you know. They have also a little bit more purchasing power and um, because they have more available income, more access to education towards insurance. And obviously, you know, the, the technology is pushing them also to like, hey, you know, buying insurance is a good thing. Um, but, you know, 
and the other, the fourth thing I think the interesting thing is too is that you know as in many under industries and con uh, uh, continents, communication flow is growing and people have more awareness, right? And one thing that happened to all of us, obviously, but affected a lot of those you know developing markets is COVID, right? COVID kind of kind of was a awakening process for a lot of people of like, hey. You know, I, I have to maybe change my, change my mindset, be prepared differently for the future, uh, think about how to save money. And, you know, a, a lot of people in that time are very like family oriented as well. Right. Uh, I actually, you know, as I mentioned, I was born in Iran and Iran in the Middle East and also very family oriented. So you think about like, how can I protect my family? Mm -hmm. How can I make it safe if I'm not there anymore? And so insurance is like kind of like an uh, interesting angle to that. Um, but, you know, I think these are like the things that are very interesting and happening in terms of insurance and insure tech. Um, but I think we're just at the beginning when you think about uh, LATAM and other kind of developed markets, right? Um, LATAM is like, I would say, at least 10 to 15 years behind, right? Mm -hmm. And I see it in also in, in terms of like what is what is being built in insure tech uh, within within that time, right? A lot of things are um, around um, enabling and collaborating with insurers and intermediaries, right? I think 40 to 50% of the insure techs are doing that. 40% are uh, dedicated to digital distribution. That might be anything from like, um, you know, product comparison websites to maybe, you know, building an MGA. And then 10% are really working on like new business models and being a full stack carrier actually. So mm -hmm. it's, it's um, you know, these are the things that, that makes it exciting for that time. Mm -hmm. Talking about that kind of being behind, um, I think that's kind of interesting because obviously there's a kind of blueprint in front of them from other kind of slightly more developed insurance yep. um, ecosystems. Because my understanding is LATAM is very dominated by agents and brokers still, isn't it? Is that still the case? That's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. Is, is that why uh, B2C specifically is a, is a challenge in that, in that area? Is, is, is that why there's not the uptake there? That's one appetite, but I think it goes back to like, you know, um, what I said before with like, um, I think cultural differences as well. And like the tight knit community of like trusting each other, I feel. And I, again, it's it's the same for me as a Middle Eastern guy who like also grew up in Europe, like a lot is based on trust and how you perceive someone, right? So the cultural thinking is different there uh, in LATAM and, and, and I've seen it. And everything is based on trust and relationships, right? And it's actually interesting because I feel uh, I've seen it in other countries and continents before, even in Europe, right? I mean, um, I've worked with a large carrier in, in in Eastern Europe, and when I when I was working with them, I was surprised because I mean, Eastern Europe, you know, developed market like you know, digitally savvy, young population, and still ninety percent of the business was driven through brokers and agents, right? I mean, they were like, no, but nobody buys anything online here so far, and that was actually just four years ago, right? And so I think, you know, uh, it's all about the relationship-based business and that's why B2C is hard to sell. And one interesting fact, actually, um, when I started my, my journey to understand the Latin market better, I spoke to a bunch of startups and one, you know, still like in my mind and I asked them like, why, why, why is B2C not working? And I was prepared to do a complete different uh, uh, answer, but he was like, listen, um, when you put a put a put a product online, and then as as we know it from from Europe and also the US, you put your information in, and you put everything in, and at the end it shows your price of like let's say seven dollars a month, and then you buy it, right? In Latam, if you do that, people see the price, and what they do, they go back to their agents and be like, "Hey, I have an eighty dollar price. Can you give it to me for seventy dollars?" And that's yeah. how you lose the customer, right? And that's yeah. also another aspect of like the digital enablement. Or like the B two C, which which is hard, hard to do, and um, it, yeah. So that's I think the most the biggest reason. Uh, however, I mean I've been talking to a bunch of people. Things are transitioning more and more uh, into like you know enabling the the digital sale and like being more like direct to consumer. However, most of the things that are working and will work for the foreseeable future are more. Uh, agent and broker enablement, right? So you build a digital product and like still enable the agent and broker to sell it digitally. Uh, however, it's still face-to-face -face or meaning like through an app that the agent has, right? Because the agent has still the relationship with the client and it's really hard to get that relationship just online and be like, hey, 
you know, buy it just for me because I'm a mere insured tech one or something, right? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that you know, embedded has been the thing that we talk about, but but we quite often sort of talk about embedded only in kind of digital processes. But I always think about embedded as like trying to put put it into the flow of people's existing relationships with a product or service. And so, you know, enabling brokers and agents is is yes, it's, a, it's an over broadening of the use of it, but to a certain extent, it's, it's kind of part of that model. Is just you're just giving better tools. Um, on that slight point, and then I'm going to move on to closing the protection gap, because I think that's a really interesting conversation to have, is just, is there a limitation and, and do you get wary from a VC perspective that if people are just trying to kind of lift what's kind of worked or been, or at least been worked on and developed from in short, maybe uh, communities in, in US or Europe, and then trying to kind of put it into LATAM, because th does that show a kind of lack of understanding of kind of the localized market? Um, are, are, are people potentially limiting innovation if they're trying to borrow too much from what's happened before? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I always said that, and I learned that pretty quickly, um, that, you know, you can't just resemble things just because they work in, in the U.S. They will not really work in other countries, right? Uh, specifically in Latam. And uh, again, given that, you know, um, the, the mindset is just different, there's cultural differences, the language barriers, I mean, that you can, might be, be able to overcome However, and I was just talking to someone today about it as well, insurance incumbents itself, uh, themselves are like lacking technology innovation, right? So in that time, it's not that like the, the incumbents are so at the forefront. They still have a lot of legacy system systems that are even way more behind than what we see in, in US or, or in Europe. So they are not really, you know, um, uh, working on that as well. Um, so you know, just putting, just taking one example and deploying it somewhere else, it might maybe work from a developed country to developed country. But even there, you know, think about it, like people who have developed insure techs in Europe have a hard time bringing it to the US. Most of the, most of the insure techs that I've seen actually build something in the US and then eventually, you know, branch out to, to other countries, right? But that's also not like an easy endeavor. Right. Uh, because, again, we're, we're even if you think about Europe, you know, developed market, people understand like the digitally savvy, like, you know, have the financial means and whatnot. But, you know, it's not just easy, just plug and play model to just take it from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was smiling slightly because I, I was thinking it's probably been my remit for about the last two years is, is a U.S. company going, we're going to the U.K. Can you find me someone that's going to know the lay of the land or, or vice versa? Um, yeah. Cause, cause the understanding is it is very different. Um, in terms of kind of um, the protection gap, um, we had an interesting conversation specifically about parametrics. I don't want to limit it to that, but parametric assurance is, is one way of addressing closing that protection gap. Um, are you seeing any sort of exciting use cases that really resonate with that kind of protection gap issue in LATAM and, and, and who in your interest, in your perspective, is doing it particularly well? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the protection gap is is an issue all over the world, right? I mean, it's not that, you know, developed markets are lacking that, but, um, sure. you know, 30% of the losses, I think, from natural catastrophes have been covered by insurance. And I think the, the most um, severe uh, impacted um, populations are the ones in uh, middle to low income countries where actually like 90% is, is not covered. And I think LATAM is a great example for that as well, because, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, agriculture um, activity happening, you know, a lot of farmers like, you know, small scale, like one man shop farmers that are like, you know, uh, having their own operations, but don't really have the means to, you know, buy insurance because from what they get from, from selling, the agricultural products is just enough to like cover their means. So it's it's not that they wake up and think of like, how can I get insurance? And even if they do so, it's really hard to get insurance, right? So I think parametric insurance is really interesting in those markets. And interestingly enough, when I was looking more and more into like, you know, LATAM, you know, there have been a bunch of like um, initiatives already happening to enable, you know, these um this, this kind of population that is underserved or is the, where the protection gap is the biggest, right? In Mexico specifically, um, the country had implemented a, a program which is called Cadena to protect vulnerable farmers from losses through some sort of a parametric insurance. They started, I think, in 2003 
and you know we're going until 2018 or so um and it was kind of um you know covering like really around i think 400 million in premiums uh at the end of like the program and what they did was like you know they the government basically subsidized the insurance for these farmers and it was some sort of a parametric insurance product but it was still very cumbersome right so it was not really digital savvy you know it was just like hey if you live in this region and we have some sort of like a weather uh data that we look at and you were impacted then you're eligible for like insurance and you have to just you know file uh, i don't know one paperwork and you get like your your reimbursement within a day or whatever week but still very cumbersome and they kind of shut it down and then um in 2018 i think also interestingly enough there was a uh, G7 summit, which which uh, launched an uh, insure resilience initiative to basically give um, access to 400 million people, mostly in developing countries um, that are affected by climate risk, some sort of an insurance product. And, you know, this is also, again, going back to like uh, how parametric can help here, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the reason why parametric is interesting is because it enables like a quick payout uh, based on defined parameters and, you know, helps those people in need so they don't have to wait to get reimbursed to rebuild whatever they have to rebuild or basically don't lack any financial resources when, when, when a natural catastrophe happens. Mm -hmm. However, most of the parametric things I've seen so far are really, you know, um, focused still on like distributing the product. So they're touching somehow the product side or the reinsurance side or the distribution side. So, and, and take some risk, right? I mean, there's companies like Descartes in France, which you might know, there's Arbol in the US. But again, most of them are like risk-taking entities, you know, which which is okay, but it will take a long time to get to market. You know, these two that I mentioned actually have have done pretty well for themselves. But one company that, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about and really like the founder is, is Raincoat in, in LATAM which is focused on a Latin market. And I think why, why I think that this one is really interesting is that they don't really touch the risk. They are basically an enablement platform to enable both like, you know, the insurer to sell insurance, but also, you know, um, uh, enable on the other side, the distribution as well, right? So they, they basically just facilitate the trade or like the, the, the parametric insurance trade and don't really touch the risk. And so I think that's like a really interesting model because they have built a kind of um, a technology platform that can enable both sides of the equation where, you know, others that go for uh, building an MGA or a carrier that they might take risk and it will take longer to do so. Um, but I think we're still like, you know, far away from where we can go, right? I mean, uh, LATAM is just one, one of the, uh, continents where this is interesting. I think there's other initiatives also happening in in Africa, in Asia, and so on and so forth. But you know, parametric is a great opportunity to um, you know enable those vulnerable communities to to be reimbursed quicker and better, and to build up their lives again after a natural catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, we're big, we're big fans of it, and, and we've talked about it many times on, on on the pod and we've actually had to the from the arvel on it was, a, it was a really interesting business and yeah caught up with him just before christmas and, and, and doing very well and um yeah yukar who recently was a, was a parametric um mga that we like and good friends with tim uh, uh yeah there's some really yeah. interesting stuff happening because you, you've got use cases that it, it, it is it's, it's doing the job of insurance that we always say it should do which is is, is looking after people at their kind of you know their lowest incident in their lives and, and allowing them to move on and that one of the challenges has always been that claims process and removing that is is, is such a kind of obvious win uh, for getting people back on their feet so yeah fully supported um, from here um it's it's, but, it's also about scalability right i mean like you know parametric products have been have been around for a while and the insurance re reinsurer have been like you know doing this for a long time but most of them were like really for large scale projects but how can you make it scalable on a small scale, on a small, on a smaller base, right? And make it more quicker and more efficient. I think that's where, you know, uh, technology can play a huge role. 
yeah yeah that's yeah exactly it's, it's, it was, I was always asking the kind of questions like why now and it's just simply put we're in the position to do that now and the, and the technology's kind of distributed at scale um I'm really conscious of time so I just wanted to kind of I'm always interested particularly when I speak to people that work in your type of role what do you see next as the kind of evolution of insure tech what do you think's on the horizon um for kind of I don't know where we're at. Are we, are we at Insure Tech 4.0 or is it 3.0? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I'm, I'm next thing. Yeah, exactly. I've lost myself too. I've lost <laughs> myself too. Um, frankly speaking, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, I still believe there is a lot of opportunity in the specialized niche markets as I think that's where I, I spent most of my time on. Um, there is a lot of also of um, activity happening on the enabler side. Enablers are like the companies that kind of enable insurance companies and either on the uh, data side, on, on the underwriting side or claim side. I think, you know, the claim side, you know, is, is very interesting to me as well. I think there's a lot of opportunity. However, I think uh, my challenges with those companies and enable insur insurance companies is that how can you get to scale quickly, right? Um, because you are so limited with how much you can do. There's like, a, you know, the process takes long with insurance companies to sell to. And even if you can get in, you know, how big of a, you know, um, big of a revenue stream can you expect from the insurance company? So I, I still believe there is opportunity on the enablement side. The question is like in which bucket it is, right? And I feel like claims might be a good bucket to start in because again, if you think about insurance, Right. I feel like there's two or three touch points from a consumer perspective. One is when you buy it, right? And most is defined by most of the time defined by price if you are like in the commoditized markets. The second might be like the renewal, right? When it comes to renewal and if, if the insurer increases your price, you might look for something else. And if not, sometimes people don't even look for price. They're like, okay, whatever, I'm just gonna keep it. But I think the third and really important point where insurance breaks is the claims process. And when you have an issue, how can you quickly and effectively and efficiently resolve it to make the customer happy? So I think that's where I'm interested in as well to understand more. So if any company is building in the claim space, I'm really interested to hear about it. But um, also for any company who's building in a niche insurance space, I'm more than open to you know take a look and, and converse and, and learn more. Um, thank you, uh, Amir. You've, you've opened your door to being bombarded with um, decks, but that's no bad thing. And uh, I've made no secret of the fact that your know, claims, <laughs> claims fascinates me. I used to work in claims, and then I spent the first half of my um, recruitment career ex exclusively working on claims mandates. And it was really, really fascinating for me because none of my colleagues believed me, and they thought I did nothing for like nine months of the year. And then we did, I did so 75 percent of my revenue all year was in the last three months of the year and I, and I always said because it was the investment cycle of importance so at the start of the year everyone wants to grow they invest in the kind of either their brokers or their underwriters and they're trying to grow the portfolio uh, but the problem with uh, growing your portfolio is by the end of the year you'll start to have a lot of claims coming in you need resource so uh, <laughs> I, I kind of reflect that on the investment market and and, and the evolution of insure tech to say all the it was all about distribution then it's about now it's now at some point it has to come to come to claims and we are seeing some really exciting stuff happening claims um but i'm with you because you know we've sold a lot of people a lot of insurance and we've lot worked out different ways to sell new insurance and we're talking about yep. new niches um but we need to get better with that claims process because otherwise we're not really moving forward at all i don't think. absolutely um Amir, thank you so much for being a guest um i really appreciate um you being thanks on for there. having me um, yeah, great conversation, and and look, hope to hope to touch base with you at one of the events um, over this year because I'm sure I'll see you at either New York or ITC or something like that. Absolutely, thanks for having me, Alex. Really, really like uh, appreciate it. Thank you. It's fun time. All right, talk to you soon.